This is VOA Africa. Hello, I'm Esther Gidoui. You are, it's Friday, April 10th. This is Africa 54. Due to the global outbreak of COVID-19, Voice of America is taking every necessary precaution to safeguard its employees. So our broadcast will look a little different today and in the near future as we, out of an abundance of caution, reduce our staffing at our VOA headquarters here in Washington. We're working to help keep you informed about what's going on and we appreciate you staying with us on Africa 54. The global coronavirus pandemic is causing a great many people excruciating pain and suffering. As much as the world adheres to shelter in place orders from their local and national governments to slow the transmission of the deadly virus, more than 1.6 million people have contracted the disease, according to the Johns Hopkins Coronavirus Resource Center. The United States continues to be the global hotspot for the virus with more than 466,000 reported cases. Spain and Italy follow with over 153,000 and 143,000 respectively. Finance ministers from the 19 Eurozone countries have agreed on a package worth more than half a trillion euros to help companies, workers and healthcare systems mitigate the economic consequences of the coronavirus outbreak. UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres told the UN Security Council Thursday the pandemic poses a significant threat to the maintenance of international peace and security, potentially leading to an increase in social unrest and violence that would greatly undermine the ability to fight the disease. Now to Africa, where all Botswana's parliamentarians, including President Mokwesi Masisi, will be quarantined for 14 days and tested for COVID-19 after a health worker screening lawmakers for the virus tested positive. That case is one of seven new confirmed cases in the Southern African country, bringing their total to 13. Meanwhile, World Health Organization Africa Chief Mashido Moeti says there's an urgent need to expand testing capacity beyond capital cities in Africa as the virus spreads through countries. The global COVID-19 pandemic is appending people's lives. In many countries, schools and businesses are closed and families are separated. People are afraid of getting the virus and they worry that their loved ones will get sick and die. A lot of anxiety comes with this outbreak, but there are ways to cope. VOA's Carol Pearson explains. Empty shelves at the grocery store were one of the early signs that the new coronavirus was spreading in the U.S. People began buying and hoarding more food and supplies than they needed. And when people's coping mechanisms are overwhelmed, they begin to do things to manage uncertainty. Jaeger says there are better ways people can cope with the stress. They can ground themselves in conversations with family members, knowing that they're home and safe through the variety of, of communication methods we have today. <laughs> With video chats, people can see their family members and friends, even if they're far away. They can also use exercise to help them cope. Uh, we know that that is useful for our physical well-being and our emotional well-being. Uh, it's great research on physical exertion uh, being a good uh, treatment for depression, uh, for anxiety as well. Another important thing is to set goals, even small ones. We need to have things that are successes. We need to have things that are finished. We need to be able to say, oh, look at that, I did that, because that's what helps mitigate the anxiety we're experiencing. It also helps to look back at the way we've handled other challenges. All of us are growing the most when we're living outside of our comfort zone. And certainly this is a time where the overwhelming majority of us are finding ourselves outside of our comfort zone. And don't forget to laugh. Doses of humor are good for us. I think it is a way to activate good brain chemistry and uh, actually protect ourselves with better immune function. Humor is really good medicine. And when you share an experience, even from a distance, it's a way of bringing the community together. Carol Pearson, VOA News, Washington. 
Scientists at a German hospital are hoping to help seriously ill patients suffering from the coronavirus disease with the intravenously administered immune plasma from donors who recovered from the illness. Although it's not described as a vaccine, it could provide a meaningful treatment. Adam Reed reports. Scientists all over the world are searching for effective treatments for patients suffering with COVID-19. And one lab in Germany thinks it's made a positive breakthrough. At Southern Germany's Erlangen University Hospital, they hope to help some of the most seriously ill patients with intravenously administered immune plasma from donors who've recovered from the illness. Holger Hackstein, who heads the hospital's transfusion medicine department, he says the immune plasma can help patients as it contains virus-specific antibodies and therefore means they're in a position to favorably influence the patient's disease. However, Hackstein stressed the therapy, which he hopes to begin on coronavirus patients soon, is not a vaccine. The aim is to start accepting plasma donations from recovered patients in the coming days, pending analysis that they are no longer contagious. In Berlin, the head of Germany's disease control center called the efforts one of the most worthwhile approaches and definitely promising. Adam Reed of Reuters with that report. The Democratic Republic of Congo is placing the coronavirus epicenter in that country under lockdown. Authorities in Kinshasa closed the main business district earlier this week as they try to curb the spread of COVID-19. The Central African country is reporting more than 180 infections and at least 20 deaths linked to the pandemic. VOS Heidi Adams Fitzpatrick spoke to correspondent Anastasi Tudiesh in Kinshasa and began by asking her who is most affected by the lockdown. Lagumbe is the name of the district that is on lockdown right now. And you have all the, the most important offices, um, the ministries, um, the most important businesses are in Gombe. For the way it uh, impacts and affects people, everybody is in a way. Businessmen are, but so are people who work in their houses. And so are people who depend on them that's the way the economy works here. You have one wealthy person that, that you know, takes care of different families, a certain amount of families. And the fact that Gombe, which is the most affluent area, one of the most affluent areas, is shut down, it's also, in a way, shutting down hundreds of families. And how are hospitals and doctors coping, um, not just with what they have to deal with now, but what could potentially be coming down the, down the pike? Just like everybody everywhere else in the world, they are doing whatever they can with, with what they have, which is not much. The head of the center task response, uh, Jean-Jacques Mouyembe, who's a virologist and who was part of the team that discovered um, the virus Ebola in the early 70s, said that uh, there will be more supplies coming, medical supplies, uh, masks and gloves and ventilators. Uh, so far, it's the t situation is, is pretty dire in, in, in hospitals. Uh, do you think the way that the country has dealt with Ebola um, is helping or hurting its efforts to deal with um, the spread of the coronavirus right now? It, it is really helping because uh, we still have the supplies uh, we had for Ebola and the rituals, especially the uh, sanitary rituals, you know, the clean, cleaning uh, ritual, washing the hands and checking the temperature, um, we have the supply need the supplies needed. Of course, not enough because uh, DRC is a vast country. But uh, the routine is there and the habits is there. So it was not very difficult for Dr. Muyembe and his teams to implement that in, in people's minds. We knew that when Ebola happened, there were all sorts of myths and stories that, you know, were circulating. What are you seeing this time around? Well, uh, just like with AIDS, and you said it with Ebola, there always is a portion of the population that look at a new disease as, oh, it's not for us, it won't happen to us. Um, in this specific case, people think that, you know, poor people think that it's a rich person disease. To be infected with a virus, you need to be able to uh, have enough money to pay a ticket and go abroad because the cases were imported. And I have spoken with people who told me not one Congolese will die from 
uh, these disease because it's and I kept wondering, I asked them why. Oh, you know, it's something that comes from abroad. Mostly people who, who were infected and he, who died from it were celebrities. Uh, the new one who has um, talked about it was um, a minister here, and she lost two, uh, two siblings. I think it only reinforces the feeling that it, co it comes from abroad and it's only in contact with people from abroad. Dr. Buyembe okay. says that, it's, you know, you don't need to even touch them. You can be in the same room, so it can happen to anyone. What I am observing from my discussions with people is that it's still not very clear in everybody's mind. And that might be even more dangerous than the virus itself. That was Heidi Adams Fitzpatrick speaking to Anastasi Tudiesh in Kinshasa. At a time when America's healthcare system is being strained to the breaking point due to COVID-19 pandemic and states are summoning medical professionals into emergency service, many immigrant physicians say U.S. visa restrictions limit how much they can help. Immigration reporter Aline Barrows has more. While many hospitals are overwhelmed with COVID-19 patients, foreign doctors working in the U.S. say they stand ready to do more to care for the sick, but visa restrictions are getting in the way. I'm on H-1B visa, so that means it's a work visa and I'm authorized to work at a specific hospital and a specific job. It's not even a hospital. Even in my hospital, I can't work in ER if they get overwhelmed. Right now, we are not but I can't work anywhere except the specific hospitalist job. Speaking from Logan, West Virginia, Dr. Yela Manchili is one of thousands of foreign doctors who are working in the U.S. on temporary visas. His contract gives him 10 days off after working 15 straight days. We are here U.S. trained professionals that are not able to help in this crisis. Those on the temporary work visas in the U.S can only switch jobs if they apply to change their visas. But the U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services, which adjudicates visa requests, is closed during the coronavirus outbreak. Restrictions on foreign doctors are tightly defined by the Residency Program and the Educational Commission for Foreign Medical Graduates, says immigration lawyer Greg Siskind. A lot of rules as far as where doctors are allowed to work, how many hours they can work, and all that has to be approved um, by the State Department and by ECFMG as far as any variation from what they're supposed to be doing. Meanwhile, the State Department is encouraging medical professionals seeking work in the U.S. to contact the nearest U.S. Embassy or consulate for a visa appointment. Petitions will be handled on a case-by-case -case basis, according to an email provided to VOA by the State Department. Like many foreign workers, Immigrant doctors are ready in the U.S. worried about their ability to work at all if their visas expire while immigration offices are closed. I'm also worried about my visa paperwork at the same time, just because USCIS is currently not functioning that well. And, um, and so I do have a barrier uh, because I need to have some visa paperwork taken care of before the end of June. Sin, who works on the front lines of the COVID-19 epidemic in West Virginia, is frustrated by the restrictions. One of the ways of resolving this could be uh, uh, lifting the restriction of visa and allowing physicians to uh, work um, or just have a different category for physicians. Uh, because there's dire need of physicians in this country. In an email to VOA, a USCIS spokesperson says the agency will assess options related to temporary worker programs as needs arise during the pandemic. Alini Barrows, VOA News, Washington. We're excited to hear what you think about Africa 54 and the stories we cover. Join the discussion on Facebook. The address is Africa 54. We're also streaming our broadcast live on Facebook. Please watch and share our show with your friends. Also check out our headlines 24-7 on voaafrica.com. Still to come, as anxiety over COVID-19 grows, we'll try to cheer you up and lift your spirits with a new Afrobeat song out of Nigeria. We'll be right back after this break. Hi, 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 you just hi, hi, hi. Baba, when you walk 
walk away. I wanna make you my own man. I don't wanna waste no time. I say all oh, love, all oh, love, my mama. You know I'm wanting you. I say all oh, love, all oh, love, my mama. Can I be? Welcome back to Africa 54. Residents in Wuhan, China, the original epicenter of the coronavirus, are breathing a sigh of relief as a mandatory lockdown has ended and other restrictions are being gradually lifted. But they are also mourning those who lost their lives to the illness. Viewers Maria Madiello reports. A special moment to mourn for the dead from the virus in Wuhan, the capital of Hubei province. Cars, trains, and ships sounded their horns while pedestrians bowed their heads in silence. I mourned the big calamity China has faced. What happened to these people was very unfortunate. My heart is heavy for those white angels. Slowly, people are starting to return to work. Wuhan's vegetable vendors resumed their trade behind large yellow barriers with chairs and stools set up on the other side for customers. Our business is not bad. Here is definitely better than indoors. People are willing to buy things outside. They quickly buy and leave. I don't feel safe going to a supermarket. There are too many people. Many infections happen in the supermarket. Elsewhere, people were out riding their bikes. One resident in particular enjoyed a family reunion. My wife works in a fever clinic. She was not sure if she was infected, so she and her colleagues were under quarantine until today. Our compound has lifted the lockdown, so she took a day off and came to see our son, who hasn't seen his mother for two months. The Chinese government says about 2,500 people died in the city of 11 million people, accounting for more than 75 percent of China's coronavirus fatalities. But some in the West have raised the questions about whether these government figures are completely transparent. Maria Magyalu, VOA News. Authorities worldwide are imposing unprecedented restrictions on citizens' freedoms in an effort to try to prevent the spread of the coronavirus. But human rights groups warn that some governments are exploiting the state of emergency to grab power. In a multi-part series, VOA examines how, even in established democracies, there are fears that the health crisis is being used to silence critics and squash basic democratic rights. Henry Ridgewell reports from London. The extraordinary restrictions on basic freedoms are in most cases necessary to fight the COVID-19 virus, says Human Rights Watch Executive Director Kenneth Roth. But sadly, we're also seeing governments that are actually much more focused on using the virus as a pretext to crack down on their critics and to consolidate their power. In China, the origin of the virus, doctors in Wuhan tried to alert the world to the dangers of the new disease. And the Chinese authorities, rather than heeding that warning, suppressed it. They censored them. They reprimanded them. And that gave the virus a three-week disastrous head start, during which time it went global. In the months since, normal checks on power in country after country have been suspended, warns United Nations Special Rapporteur Agnes Kalamar. The court have far less um, power than they used to. Parliaments as well are far weaker under the state of emergency. In Hungary, Prime Minister Viktor Orban pushed through emergency legislation in March with no time limit that basically allows him to rule by decree without any parliamentary oversight. 
It abandons elections. Many countries have banned street protests. If you think about the Algerian military-led government or, or President Putin in Russia, um, the Lebanese, the Iraqi governments, um, Prime Minister Modi in India, these are all governments that were facing big pro-democracy challenges in the streets. For the time being, those protests have to stop. Everybody understands that. But how long will the government maintain rules prohibiting that kind of free assembly just because it's convenient? Police have been given extra powers to enforce a lockdown. In Kenya, a 13-year-old boy was accidentally shot dead. In Cape Town, police evicted dozens of migrants from a church. Footage emerged of police in India spraying migrant workers with disinfectant. In the name of saving as many lives as possible, we are going to put the life of uh, the most vulnerable groups at greater risk. History tells us that those moments are situations, moments where police powers is likely to be abused. The September 11, 2001 terror attacks on the United States are a case in point, says Roth. That too was a moment in which people were fearful. They asked governments to protect them. And many governments, um, rather than doing what was really necessary to protect them, seized all kinds of extraordinary powers that it took a long, long time to relinquish. For now, restrictions on our freedom are accepted as necessary weapons in fighting COVID-19. The fear is those restrictions could far outlive the disease itself. Henry Ridgewell for VOA News, London. Elephants living in Kenya's Sheldrick Wildlife Park are a huge draw for tourists, but the COVID-19 outbreak means the park will likely see far fewer visitors and dollars this year. Francis Maguire reports. These baby elephants are a big draw for tourists at Kenya's Sheldrick Wildlife Trust. But hundreds of visitors who'd normally greet the animals for their morning feed are nowhere in sight. Airports and borders closed last month as the country locked down, meaning a severe loss of revenue for Kenya's billion dollar tourism sector. Sheldrick Wildlife Trust manager Kirsty Smith. We can have up to 500 people here in just an hour. So that's an incredible source of revenue for us, for our operations, um, that we aren't seeing come in at the moment. Parks like this rely heavily on tourists to survive. At the SWT's Elephant Orphanage, visitor fees pay for 13 anti-poaching teams and five veterinary teams. Obviously, Kenya will be so hard hit by the lack of tourism this year. I believe in the last few years it's brought in over a billion US dollars in revenue for Kenya. So it will be a challenge moving forward, but one that we need to take on and we will continue to do our work. The orphanage closed its doors on March 15th. It stripped the park of the near $5 fees it received daily from around 500 visitors. It's going to be a tough year ahead for wildlife reserves all over Africa as tourists stay away. But the workers at this park are determined to fight through the crisis and keep these animals alive. In our entertainment segment, there are a lot of new songs about the coronavirus popping up across Africa and the diaspora. But the host of VOA's Music Time in Africa, Heather Maxwell, wanted to let music briefly take our minds off COVID-19. She and Kwame Ofori offer nobody a new Afrobeat song out of Nigeria to lift your spirits. Hello, everybody. We're doing Song of the Week, but we are not in our studios at VOA. I'm at home. Kwame. I'm also here in my house. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and you probably all are too, and we hope so, because it's most important that we all stay safe. Yeah. Uh, but music can make us happy, and that's what we're going to try to do with this song. Now, Kwame, you picked it out, so why don't you tell everybody about it? Yep, and this week's song of the week is Nobody by DJ Neptune featuring Joe Boy. Uh, I really love this song for the same reason you do. It's just uplifting, upbeat, and we really need that right now. Mm -hmm. Very much so. Yeah. Well, that was song of the week. The title was Nobody by... DJ Neptune featuring Joe Boy and Mr. Easy. Yeah, I'm Heather Maxwell.
and I'm Mr. Sante. And we hope you stay safe and sound all week long. Yep. But that and was that was song, song of, of the, the week. week. <laughs> and that's our show for today. Be sure to watch Africa 54 on our website at voaafrica.com. From all of us here in Washington, have a great weekend.